I appreciate that the, 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 uh, the poets are somewhat problematic figure amongst Misians, uh, and Popper is an even more problematic figure amongst the Austrian economists at large. Uh, one of my projects is to explain the synergy of the thought of Popper to the qualification. Synergy of the Popper and Austrian economics. And part of this, a major part of this, is the partnership of Popper and Hayek in particular relating to what Peter Betke described as Hayek's great project to reframe economics, to, to, re, to restore the broad expanse of economics, the classical period from Adam Smith to Menger, to restore this, the atlas he describes in our group, the hour glass of economics was broad, it became narrow in the 20th century under the influence of false ideas about science and the intrusion of mathematics and aggregates through Keynesian macroeconomics. And Berkey's take on Hayek is that Hayek wanted to restore the broad scope of economics to pay attention, to dispose of. Uh, what he called scientism, the false concept of science, uh, to dispose of the, to, to correct the, the abuse of reason by way of constructivist rationalism, and to re regain some focus on the framework of economic activity in, this, in the institutions, the social framework, and the moral framework of society and culture. So that was Petke's argument that Hayek moved from a fairly focused technical economics of the trade cycle <coughs> monetary theory to a project of philosophical and social reconstruction. And there were three aspects of this process of reconstruction. There was the attack on scientism, there was the attack on constructivist rationality, and there was a, a, a plea for a attention to the broader social institutional framework. Now, that my point is that uh, in that particular book by Peter Vetti, Popper was not a player. He was relegated to a friend of Hayek. Didn't get, his contribution didn't get any acknowledgement in his partnership with Hayek. But I think Popper was a powerful partner of Hayek. Uh, they were friends for most of their lives. They exchanged manuscripts. They admired each other's work. <coughs> although clearly Popper never learned enough economics from Hayek or from Mises or from anybody else to avoid some fairly, fairly serious missteps in his economic policy proposals. But still, there is a philosophical affinity. And the first part of that is Popper's conception of science, which refutes the concept of scientism. Uh, the attempt to import science into the social sciences, which was described as scientism, was based on a false concept of, phys of physics. Uh, Popper corrected that, as, as my, new, my new colleague, uh, my new colleague John Sardino, uh, has turned up to has a similar project to, to show how, how Popper corrected and helped and modified uh, Hayek's views on scientism to show that a proper understanding of science, a la Popper, gets over the problem of scientism. Now the second prong of Hayek's project, uh, the, the, his attack on constructivist rationalism, uh, Popper conducted the same attack, but he attacked what he called comprehensive rationalism in favour of his own concept of critical rationalism, which essentially boils down to the attitude that uh, I may be you may be right and I may be wrong, and by an effort we can get closer to the truth. And that's very close to uh, von Mises' uh, approach, the, critic, the critical approach, where he says on page 68 of Human Action, uh, we, we could be wrong, we just have to keep testing and criticising uh, to, to hope that we're still standing on solid ground. Moving on to the third prong of Hayek's project, <coughs> restoring attention to the social institutional framework. Now this is something that Popper advocated. He advocated it in a few very short paragraphs 
towards the end of his small book, uh, The Poverty of Historicism. Now, is everybody here familiar with the poverty? <coughs> Let's have a show of hands for people who have actually read right through the beginning to end of the poverty of historicism. I think we have four hands. Five. Okay. Six. Sorry, I'm scared. Okay. Okay, so I think we can, I can say in the room we have mostly people who have. But this will be news. This is what I'm just about to tell you is news. Because it, this is, comes out of the poverty of historicism and it, it sort of contradicts the general conception of Popper in the philosophy of science. When Popper was debating with Thomas Kuhn, Kuhn said to Popper roughly, well, why don't you adopt a, some more of a psychological and a sociological approach to why people change their minds about theories? And Popper said he was not going to go anywhere near that because he thought psychology and sociology were so undeveloped that they had nothing to offer at all about explaining how people change their minds. So he would, would not go to the sociology of knowledge or psychology of knowledge. But in the poverty of historicism, discussing uh, how to explain scientific and industrial progress, he criticised Comte and Mill to, to look towards psychological factors, factors of the human propensity to progress. <coughs> but Popper thought there are other human propensities like, like forgetfulness and idleness. So he couldn't go to psychological factors to explain scientific and industrial progress. He thought he should look to the social and institutional context uh, because he said, right, uh, science is a social process. Uh, what we call rationality is not a, so much a human faculty as it's something that emerges through the give and take, or this like the free trade in ideas and criticism between people with different points of view. And whatever rationality or objectivity we have is not due to our psychological capacity or our virtue or wisdom, it's because other people can t call us to account if we are clear enough in what we're saying, we can be criticised, challenged, and we can criticise and challenge others. And out of this social process of give and take emerges what we might call the objectivity and rationality of debate <coughs> and discussion and science and democracy. <coughs> so having said that, uh, we should look to the social institutional context of science uh, in the back end of the small book, The Poverty of Historicism, <coughs> Popper then returned to his major interests in epistemology, uh, logic, biology, uh, quantum physics, and did, did nothing to pursue that program of looking at the social institutional framework of science. That was left to other people, friends and colleagues, uh, notably the art historian Ernst Gombrich, uh, the Austrian born. Uh, scholar, uh, a major figure in his field, a similar generation of Popper. Uh, <coughs> he looked at the, the uh, things like the um, examples of architecture, fashion, uh, linguistic drift, uh, various things which exemplify the way that social change occurs as a, drug, as a result of simple psychological propensities like following a leader or playing a game that look at me, but these get translated into massive Gothic <coughs> cathedrals, uh, changes of hemlines and fashions, uh, and also changes in scientific theories. Excuse me, what was the name of the scholar? Ernst Gombrich. Mm -hmm. Yes. G-O-M-B-R-I-C-H. <coughs> uh, an Austrian. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> As a historical aside, it was Gombrich who put Popper's great big book, The Open Society of Enemies, through the press in England while Popper was in New Zealand. And Popper helped Gombrich by sending 95 aerograms of instructions to help the, with the task. Just, just a, on the side. Uh, Gombrich has been referred to St. Saint, Saint Ernst on account of the patience that he showed through that amazing performance dealing with Popper's assistance from New Zealand. Now, another man of that, who followed Popper in that regard 
was Ian Jarvey, uh, British born but mostly living in Canada. Uh, he wrote a number of papers applying this social approach or sociological approach or institutional approach. But the most interesting and exciting in some ways is the, or was the economist Gordon Tullock. Now is everybody here familiar with Gordon Tullock? Uh, Gordon Tullock uh, is regarded as one of the great economists who or the greatest who never got a Nobel Prize. Uh, he probably could have or should have shared it with Buchanan because they both pioneered public choice theory. They wrote the first big book together. Uh, but apparently I'm told that uh, Gordon Tullock irritated too many people. Uh, so he missed out on the Nobel Prize because he irritated people. <coughs> that may be true. I, I prefer the suggestion that he, he missed out because he spent too much time thinking about physics. Now, that's, I think that's not generally known, but it emerges from a very long-running correspondence between Karl Popper and Gordon Tullock. Uh, there's a man called Peter Levy at George Mason University who's, who's been a student of Tullock, and in studying Tullock, he discovered the Tullock-Popper correspondence, uh, and he found this, well, we both find this very exciting because what Tullock did, inspired by Popper, who he met at, at a Volcker conference at Emory College, so uh, he was inspired by Popper's ideas about analysing the social context of science, uh, and he put aside his manuscript on the politics of bureaucracy and wrote a book called uh, The Organisation of Inquiry. <coughs> How long do I have? Okay, well, he wrote the, the, the Organisation of Inquiry, published in 1966, basically describes what's happened in climate science, which has deteriorated to a point where it's been basically been driven by politics uh, and propaganda. <coughs> now, climate science hadn't been invented when Tullock wrote this book in 1966, uh, but it, it, may, it may have been referring to parts of the social sciences, but he described that, anal anal analysed the steps, the progressive steps, where we have too many scientists that aren't interested enough in the truth, and you have the dilution, progressive dilution and weakening of the peer review process, the capturing of this process by factions, uh, the politicisation of this process, the government control of this process by massive government funding for political purposes. The end result is a debacle of alarmism in climate science. And so this was Popper's contribution to the world in this particular area to inspire Gordon Tullock to write this wonderful book, which nobody's taken much notice of, because not, but I, they will, they will, uh, because they will be told about it. Uh, people will be told, people will learn, and the same way people will I hope learn about the synergy and the power of the combination of Popper's ideas with Austrian economics. Thank you. Questions, please, for Mr. Champion, for short comments. Um, when you say that um, Popper resolved the uh, problem of scientism uh, as outlined by Hayek, how do you mean exactly? Well, the problem of scientism was importing a defective concept of the physical sciences. Now, Hayek didn't really accept that particular picture. Well, he, didn't, he didn't think the social sciences should function on that defect, on what he regarded as a defective basis. But it turns out that what Popper explained the way that physics actually works by conjecture and refutation, it's essentially by, by conjectural a priorism, if you like. And I've written a paper describing Popper's views as conjectural a priorism. Uh, that makes a bridge to doctrine economics. But it completely got over Hayek's objections to the natural sciences because uh, around him people were adopting a fake or false conception of the natural sciences. Basically involved 
deductive approach of the German historical school, you collect all this data, except what in the 20th century they added lots of mathematics, mathematical models and aggregates. And that's going to be a very debased form of social science, a very debased form of economics. But if you get rid of the aggregates, you get rid of the inductive approach, if you start doing testing, conjecture, mm -hmm. uh, other physical science, other measures, you're okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you.